it's a good film about about for, for having conversations about race. And I think the important thing is that it actually got up there into the Oscars so that the conversation in the United States can continue. Um, as far as applying the schema or the format, uh, I don't know, it's definitely a body genre, but it's a body genre that um, is about raised bodies. And, and that makes it a, a, a more, it, that complicates, and I would, I would, if, if, if I would, it's a film I would want to write about, but in a way, it seems kind of obvious what there is what there is to say in the sense that um, uh, the the bodies that inspire fear are white bodies who are the who are the villains, and the um, the black body is the victim of of the villains, and that there is according to the logic of the film a, a real reason to be afraid and to convey to American audiences uh, uh, maybe not the most logical reasons but reasons for fear on the part of black people in, you know if you remember there's this opening scene where uh, he's just walking down the street and he's really he's really afraid uh, and you think well why is he afraid well why are black men afraid when they walk down the streets in the United States. So that's all I have, really, for that. But it's a good question. Did you have something more? I was wondering about the crime. It's what I think is interesting. Is that the way in the piece, uh, the lack of familiarity has to do with so I was wondering if, if race in some way, racial bodies, the birth of genre in a way, if it's a crossover, I, I don't know, I'm not, I'm not sure, but there's something about the fluidity, mm -hmm. the, the tears for such a long time before the blood appears. Blood takes a long time to appear in the film, but affect is really present. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, it is, and and y you're right about fluidity because there are there are apparently black bodies that are inhabited by by white bodies in in the film, and that and that gives that sort of deepens the 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 the, 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 the fear. In fact, the um, the um, uncanny quality of the film has to do with the fact that these these uh, these black bodies, which are very uh, stilted, robotic, are is, uh, are scary in a way because they are black bodies that don't seem to be black bodies. Uh, so yeah, it's a, it's a, you ought to write something about that. That's great. <laughs> Um, in fact, there was even um, 
they, they removed the camera from the courtroom and they took the testimony of the trial and they enacted it with racially marked <coughs> characters in uh, a television program that I started watching in which there was a man who played OJ, there was a man who, who and so they just gave us the trial with these, with these different actors. And to me, that just pointed to the, 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 the inherent melodrama of American trial movies, which have not been considered much as a genre, but which definitely are. And uh, I had a colleague, Carol Clover, who um, had, had written an essay that was supposed to be part of a whole book, uh, but it turned out to be just an essay in which she talked about the American system of justice, which is different than yours, because we have jury trials with oral arguments. The jury is the audience. The, uh, the arguments are made, I mean, you know, any, any, I was on an airplane for a long time coming here, and the number of, of, of courtroom dramas that I could see on all the different screens of the, of the airplane were, were extraordinary. I mean, it's just things come down to a trial in American movies, uh, and, and it's very dramatic because it's supposed to be uh, uh, the way we do it. I gather you have judges who have a lot more power. We have uh, guilty and uh, and innocent. Now, you know, not necessarily, but we have guilty and not guilty, basically. Um, and, and so, eat the prosecution's job is to argue guilt, and the defense's job is to argue not guilty. And that is inherently uh, a melodramatic uh, opposition. Somebody is being wronged. Somebody is telling the truth. Somebody isn't. And that's, I, I think I was just gearing up for that argument at the end of the uh, playing the race card book, which, uh, which culminated in the O.J. Simpson trial. melodramatist, 
who wrote bad plays on the stage and then took off when he started directing when he started directing movies. Uh, and uh, I discovered that with Griffith, in the scholarship on Griffith, there was a tendency to write about Griffith as a bad melodram melodramatist when you write about the racial part of um, Birth of a Nation, which is one of the most, I mean, if you haven't seen it, go see it. It's the most racist film in American history. Um, if you, if you, I'm sorry, I'm thinking, I just recently taught it in, a, in an American prison, and uh, it was not a popular film to see. I kept saying, well, you have to see this film, you have to understand this film. Uh, and the prisoners, who are mostly black, did not want to <laughs> do that. Uh, so what people would do with Griffith is say, well, there's the bad Griffith, and that's the melodrama part. And the good part of Griffith is the realism. Uh, and so, um, in Way Down East, the fact that he uses a real waterfall, in fact it is Niagara, <laughs> the biggest waterfall in the United States, I know you have bigger, um, and, and uh, that was realism, and, and that was great. So he took, he took the ride of the Ku Klux Klan to the rescue of the innocent white woman, uh, and it was real horses, but the bad part was always, the, you know, melodramatic simplicities of, of uh, black and white. Um, and so, it, it's, it, the tradition is always to blame the melodrama. That's why I don't blame uh, David Simon for not wanting to be described as a, as a great melodramatist. Nobody wants to accept that term. <laughs> but, it, it, on some level, we have to rehabilitate melodrama in order to talk about it at all. Here's one. Uh, 
there was a famous essay called The Gangster as Tragic Hero. So you can, it says it all right there. Um, but nobody was going to say the, the suffering woman as, as tragic hero. That was melodrama, that was tears, that was, that was wallowing in helplessness. Uh, now, what I tried to do as a, as a feminist uh, critic, for example, in the essay on Stella Dallas, which became very controversial, because I was trying to say, well, Stella Dallas has some agency. Her agency is to sacrifice. Uh, uh, but feminism was looking for better agency than that, not the usual kinds of sacrifice. We're looking for women who could actually do things. Um, you know, Thelma and Louise or, or something like that. Uh, but I said, for me, it was thinking, well, this is a film that my mother probably wept at. Why did my mother weep at this movie? I mean, I wept at it too, but I was trying to think in terms of my mother, maybe for the wrong reasons. <laughs> uh, and and uh, th that definitely became a gendered thing, you know? Uh, 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 as a mother, uh, I mean, my mother, I'm trying, I'm a, I was becoming a mother. In fact, I was pregnant when I wrote that essay. And so I was thinking about these things of motherhood and the problems of motherhood. Uh, and uh, so it all got tied up with gender. Gender and genre got, got very, very, and I know you have the same word for it. We, I think it's easier for us because we at least have two different words. I mean, that's amazing that you have just one word for it. I would like to know more about how that operates in your culture when you're trying to talk about gender and you're really talking about genre. <laughs> Does that create confusion? Uh huh. So people write about that. And... I never heard about that. Wow. I I would write about that first. <laughs> I think. Uh, so anyway, it's all it's all very very related. Um, and I forget what the beginning of your point was. Mean, what I was supposed to ask answer. <laughs> Yeah. What about gender difference or sexual difference? Yes. Uh, well, I was seeing everything like, yeah. in terms of sexual All feminists at that time were seeing things in terms of sexual difference. Uh, if, when I saw that woman put her hand on the chin uh, when she's walking, I thought, sexual difference. Um, we're, we're stuck with sexual difference. And I think in a way, we, I over-determined the importance of that. Um, but it was important to see at that time that sexual difference was operating. But if the goal of feminism is to, um, is to see the, act, the, the possible actions and agency of women, then if you put women in that ghetto too much, then they'll stay there. And then, then the power of feminism becomes only the power of showing one's victimization. And, and so that was the dilemma that I was negotiating when I was trying to understand the ending of Stella Dallas and understand what Stella was going through in terms of her own agency. Uh, and it's a complicated problem. I would love to read an essay translated from the Spanish that really talked about gender and genre. And, uh, <laughs> yes? Uh, I, I read your essays and you wrote this discussing from an American perspective. Um, I would like to ask if you have ever looked at uh, melodrama in other countries. In other cultures, yes. Um, I'm proposing to do a comparative study of French and American um, since melodrama began in France. I love Mexican melodrama, um, and uh, I, I, I would teach it sometimes a few a few films just because they were so quintessentially melodrama, and because they hadn't lost the mellows from the tradition because song and dance was so was so frequently important to them. So I'm a fan of of uh, of of the melodramatic tradition in 
Latin America in general, but I don't, I don't know it well. I don't know it well enough to write about it. Oh, and Amaldovar. I love Amaldovar. <laughs> I had a question that was great. Because yes. It's of the first question. Yes. That was about uh, in, I forgot the name of the new. Sorry. Get out. Get out. Oh, get out. I, I was thinking about the one genre. genre. <laughs> And how you see in the essay you refer to articulate and inarticulate uh, expression. Uh, how all the ecstatic uh, moments that are portrayed mainly in the female body right, are, language. Yeah. are the, the body of language. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about that movie and how the bodies are actually the void of the self. The, the person yes. and are just bodies and how uh, I, I wanted if you could uh, talk or, or I was wondering <laughs> talk more about uh, that uh, black uh, people or not white people but especially black people uh, and women have these fears that are put on the table in this mainstream genres that are about other uh, logic of power uh, in terms of in their bodies. You were talking about black men walk on the street and how he is afraid mm -hmm. because there is uh, the power of law abusing uh, him and structuring him and how uh, maybe a female or him female or feminine body that is also walking down the street and is afraid because the imperative logic is going to come and put it in its place that it's not a good place. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, how do you relate the ordenamiento of body inside genre with the ordenamiento of body in life. <laughs> that is a big question. What, what is the one Spanish word? I'm missing that. Uh, order. Classifications? Like, uh, Classifications? No, so dominate that body because it, mm -hmm. it, it, it yes. is a body. It is not a wheel. It is not a right. cell. It is primarily from the uh, <coughs> powerful viewpoint yeah. a body. Something to be used. Something that Often something that can't be spoken. 
And then, if, if it's going to resolve itself into a happy ending, it might be spoken. And that's the dramatic moment. That's the moment that Anna throws herself out into the snowstorm, nearly dies, and I would say actually is frozen as a way of cleansing her from the fact that she has had an illegitimate child. So the melodrama itself kind of punishes the woman uh, uh, for the crime that she didn't really commit, uh, but that's melodrama for you. It's not, it's, the moral problem of melodrama is never totally satisfying, as with Uncle Tom's Cabin and, and uh, Birth of a Nation. Uh, so that was a good question. Thank you. Yes? That maybe uh, what is also annoying of melodrama is that it doesn't solve the entire stop suffering. It just points at it. And maybe, I don't know,
suspending and creating, therefore, suspense in that suspension. Uh, 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 and, and then horror as being too early, in other words, when you're not ready for it, and all those, all those young women who get killed at the beginning, you know, all the people who get knocked off in, in the early moments of horror film, and then to think that the fantasy, not the reality, but the fantasy of pornography was to be on time. Um, so to that extent, I thought about rhythm, and I think it's important. Beyond that, I haven't, and I think that would be a good thing to do. <laughs> so you can see that rhythm is, is, is a kind of a tool, melodrama uses. I mean, a, a, a melody is meant to, to the melodrama uses a gadget, so to speak. If, uh, I'm if sorry. rhythm is a gadget tool. Can someone translate that for me? I, I know you're speaking English, but <laughs> if rhythm maybe, maybe, maybe my is a gadget. <laughs> A gadget, a tool. A gadget. Oh, a it's tool. a tool. Yeah. Uh huh. Is it a tool remained to be in order of action to, 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 to get to the end of suffering? A million to the end. Uh, yes, because we feel, you know, because again, one of the things that melodrama does is it takes life experience, real life experience, and then it dramatizes that. And we feel those temporal pressures all the time in life, but in these genres, they are uh, exaggerated in, in strong ways. Yeah, so good, I understand. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, you, you talked about the, the excess of, of these body terms, the excess of the, uh, the over-sexualized body, pornography, the, Excess of violence, horror, and the excess of suffering. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if uh, it's necessary that there's an excess of uh, representation in order to these body genres, uh, body genres to work, or in other words, if realism attempts against. Uh, I see. You know what I, I and I think I probably should have said this earlier that um, ultimately I don't want to use. Peter Brooks's idea of excess. Because if melodrama is a mode, and if mode is as pervasive as it seems to be, then, um, and then this brings me back to that question I asked about the classical. What we call the classical cinema, the normal cinema, that's, I don't know if you ever read David Bordwell here, uh, but he wrote this book in 1985 called uh, the classical Hollywood cinema, uh, blah, 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 I forget what the subway is uh, But where did he get that word classical? Um, why would one define, and I, I'm sure you all use it, everyone in the United States uses the term classical to talk about ordinary popular movies. Um, why would you use a term like classical, which refers to antiquity, which refers to that period when tragedy was the dominant uh, was the dominant genre or mode, why would you use that to describe movies? I mean, it's, it, it, it's, to me, it just defines. I'm going to talk about that in my talk on uh, uh, whenever this is. <laughs> Saturday. <laughs> Saturday. Santa Fe. Sa Santa Fe. Yes, Santa Fe. Uh, but uh, yeah, it, it, that's the word that I. I threw out and didn't get back to, but the problem is that the classical defined uh, melodrama as excess, and the Bordwellian, even Andre Bazanian definitions of of popular movies, American, French, um, at least if not if not more, uh, will will define melodrama as the excess. And in a way, I want to turn that around, and let's think of melodrama as the norm. Uh, and that, that throws, well, I don't know if, if I will succeed in doing that, but I would like to. Quería preguntarte eh, si tenés algún peso ahí. 
discutido acerca del de cine de ficción en general con el cine norteamericano, eh, acerca de cómo muestran los cuerpos de la mujer y del hombre en relación a, eh, no al cine pornográfico, en relación a, a estas imágenes de Mybridge que mostraste al principio, con esa diferencia en la forma en que muestran los cuerpos desnudos, ¿sabes? porque hoy creo que en general pocos directores muestran a cuerpos de hombres desnudos, como por ejemplo Pasolini, eh, bueno, hace unos años, ¿no? eh, y en general cuerpo de las mujeres. Yo sé que vos te escribiste sobre cómo, eh, bueno, recién hablabas de que la pornografía por el centro de la mujer, o también estos géneros como error en lo de la mano. Pero como una reflexión más general, porque hoy incluso las grandes estrellas, las mujeres tampoco aparecen desnudas. Sí. Ok, I'm going to need a translation. Sí, en el ¿no? Incluso autor, o dar, por ejemplo, si muestra mujeres desnudas, pero no muchos hombres desnudos. No necesario, va a ser el gato. Thank <laughs> you. 
guys? Screaming sex. Screaming, as in at the movie, screaming sex.
And so why was it in 1972 suddenly the, the so-called money shot was the was the the totem of of pornography's proof that sex was happening, um, uh, that sexual pleasure was happening, and and I think it had to do with the fact that there was doubt, there was worry that the woman wasn't being satisfied, and so how how does the male viewer uh, reassure himself that? Uh, that the woman is being satisfied in this really kind of hypocritical wrong way, but by showing the male's pleasure and making that the sort of displacement for the thing that cannot be seen. And it all had to do with what was becoming visible, becoming something that could be seen, which is why my bridge was such an <clears throat> inspiration for me, because he was the man who's who set out to see the thing that was invisible, first in horses and then in humans. Well, there's no question that pornography is the topic that 
people are still the most interested in. Um, uh, and for a while, I wanted to be not the porn professor. <laughs> I, I didn't object to being the porn professor, but I didn't want to only be the porn professor. Um, and uh, as you can see, one thing leads to another, and melodrama, uh, pornography may be leading me back to pornography in that sense in which I talked about it at the beginning of the film, of the film body's essay. Is it possible to say that melodrama is the, the larger mode into which one could fit uh, pornography on the one hand? This, and if I go back to the Sadian tradition, and see the way that has, has worked. Because the Saudian tradition is the most emotional one. It's the one that, that wants to show suffering uh, uh, and, and pleasure back to back in, in conjunction with one another. And so I think you know, actually giving this presentation has made me think that maybe yes. <laughs> yes, because I was thinking of the last question uh, you present that these two essays are contradiction, one beer to be a contradiction. Right. Because I, when I read again, uh, the first one, I saw that melodrama was something else. You yes. started to see something else. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I, I would like to know if you think that they can complement each other in some way, reaccommodate. I don't know how to use the yeah. word. Yeah, maybe, maybe that's true. I mean, I think my initial thought when you asked me, um, uh, what a good workshop talk, topic would be, I said, um, um, I, th I think I said, these are the two things that, that are bothering me, that, that concern me. And then I apologized because they were so old. But in a way, they're not resolved in a, in a good enough way. And so, you know, you continue working. You suffer and you, and you learn. <laughs> The, the last question. Stop. I promise. <laughs> I, 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 know, I notice in the books that you have a, a you reflect around teaching some yes. of the topics. I yes. Thank you very much. I would like to know. Uh, I'm sorry to come back to the same subject, but how was the experience to start teaching pornography in a university? Hmm. That we are dealing with that right now. So yes. Um, well, okay. I, the first time I taught it, I was in a literature department, so I didn't teach much film. Um, and I called it Philosophy in the Bedroom, which is which alluded to a Saudi, a well-known Saudi title, so that those people who knew Saad would know what the topic was. But I was also being very coy and careful. Uh, then I got into a fil an actual film department. And that was when I taught my first undergraduate film course. Um, that was hard. That was very, very hard. Because at that time, it would have been uh, 19, uh, 1990s? No, late, after, after, oh, actually, I wrote beyond, I wrote, uh, uh, the body, the body genres essay. When I when I started teaching at this university as a film scholar, and I I did it in a woman's studies classroom, so the expectation was feminism, um, and then I was showing that there were other kinds of feminism besides anti-pornography feminism, uh, and uh, that was difficult. It was quite difficult. The really difficult part was at that point I decided I was going to teach. Uh, I was going to teach gay pornography, lesbian, you know, real lesbian pornography and fake lesbian pornography. And uh, the real problem in the class was the men who would not look at gay pornography. I mean, the, the women sat patiently and looked at things that they hated. The men slammed the door. Uh, <laughs> dramatically to show how offended they were. And they wouldn't admit that it was homophobia. 
you know, of course, I understand homophobia, but they were sophisticated, supposedly. <laughs> so they said it was the bad dialogue and the, you know, the bad acting and all of that. Uh, so that was that was difficult. That was my first. That was my baptism in teaching pornography. I got better at it as I went on. <laughs>
because when I came to this kind of gatherings that I show enjoy a lot, uh, I wonder after, do you think that in a way that you know normal people outside university can reach and think about this kind of stuff? Because you know this is make me always feel this is so great, but it is also so close. Yes. Yeah. So that's the so, question. I understand that there's at least one journalist here, so that's up to the journalists, right? <laughs> uh, uh, that's always a problem, how do you get beyond, I mean, it, it, what you get beyond the confines of academia, I think you get beyond the confines of academia, usually when you have these melodramatic situations, and then people comment on them. Uh, so, probably this isn't going to change a lot of minds. Being translated would help. <laughs> eh, bueno, tiene relación con esta pregunta de ella porque quizás que no tiene tanto que ver con el tema, pero sí, parece. Eh, antes habías mencionado que viste cursos o talleres o seminarios en cárceles. Eh, quizás que también tiene que ver un poco con esto como salido de la academia. Eh, si querés. Eh, a mí me interesa mucho el tema, si podés contar un poco cómo fue la experiencia o eh, sobre qué se trató eh, ese taller o bueno, un poco cómo fue la experiencia con las personas y en la cárcel y si también fuiste a cárcel de mujeres, que mencionaste cárcel de hombres, pero... <risa> I 
started to teach pornography for the first time. I didn't think that I would teach it, uh, but I started to teach it when Catherine McKinnon wrote, <coughs> Catherine McKinnon was an anti-pornography feminist, a very important feminist. Uh, she wrote an essay saying that pornography was the cause of the rape of Muslim women in Bosnia. And I thought that was just so wrong, and that if people didn't know what pornography was, uh, they would, they would uh, accept such an argument. Uh, so I, I said, okay, I'm going to teach pornography to these young, innocent students who were not necessarily used to seeing pornography at that time. Uh, so it was part of my reaction to that debate. Hi. Hi. Uh, I was thinking, um, as far as I know, in the last few years, at least, there was a big um, porn industry for female women, yes. for women. So I was thinking, how is the, how can you think about the, the male that here is displayed to a women gay, the female gay, and at the same time, how you can not uh, fall in the common place of thinking about a melodramatic gay also. Mm -hmm. as, um, as thinking about the female public or audience, right. but uh, with a body uh, exceeded that is not the female public. Mm -hmm. Yes, that does, I, I think, you know, in my book, I only wrote about heterosexual pornography, but I immediately felt, oh my God, what have I done? Uh, and so I wrote a few articles about, uh, about women's pornography for women, lesbian pornography for lesbians, and I tried to make up for my terrible mistake. It wasn't a mistake, I mean, I, I wrote about 95% of all pornography. Uh, but, uh, the, the male gaze, if, if you ever read hardcore, I start out with that as a premise. Laura Mulvey, the male gaze, woman as object, man as subject. Uh, and, and, and what I discovered is that Mulvey just doesn't always function. Uh, and, and I had discovered that in horror films, I had discovered it in melodrama, um, uh, so that wasn't new. but. You know, I really had to consider Mulvey, and my way of doing that was partly to just go deeper into psychoanalysis, but partly to just use Foucault. And Foucault is the person who, you know, says historians talk historically about about women's bodies and how women's bodies became sexually saturated. How everything that we see in those Mybridge um, uh, images was actually historically determined by, uh, by discourses, various discourses of sexuality. So, uh, uh, I was fighting Mulvey the whole time, uh, and sometimes conceding, sometimes, sometimes not conceding, but uh, I, I didn't, and I no longer would ever just sort of follow the gaze as male, the, the, the idea that the gaze is male, although it was very important at one point to say the gaze is male, and then to start understanding when it isn't. Yes, like um, comedy melodrama. Uh -huh. uh, 
well, uh, get out comes to mind. <laughs> Isn't that a sort of start that seems like a comedy? Uh, then it turns into uh, 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 what I would say is a, a, a horror film that is also a, a melodrama. Um, uh, I think that the, the, there's enormous hybridity uh, uh, among genres, and that that's it's, it's the business of genres to keep changing. Um, otherwise, you know, we live in a culture of commodification. You've got to make things. You've got to make old things new, and so that's what happens. Um, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No. Yes, but I was thinking about uh, because in the in the first uh, essay you. You talk about uh, excess and, and you divide um, comedy and musical, and musical uh, like genres that you, the, the audience, has a reaction which is not the same as yes. the yes. So, a comedy is always uh, breaking. Yes, the, the comedy I don't identify with the man who slips on a banana peel. Um, I, I, I don't identify with him, and that disidentification allows me to laugh um, because I am better. I am not slipping on a banana peel. I have control of my body. Um, uh, and, and so and you're raising the whole question of identification. Identification, to me, is the way we used to think about, we used to think that one identified with the protagonist in a, in a film. Uh, but looking at the end of Stella Dallas, for example, taught me that there are many ways that one could identify, and that there's sympathy for a lot of different figures in that story, and that one of the qualities of women's films as a genre is that they are very sympathetic to lots of different points of view, rather than, you know, the male hero who will, you would just automatically identify and then that hero will kill, you know, tons of people. Um, so identification is not automatic, Identification is plural and, and multiple in, in forms. Uh, and so one of the things I try to do just sort of along the way is to, is to break with a strict notion of identification. Hi. Of course, it's also a kind of a woman's film. You 
know, it's a love story. In that way, the women's films are often love stories. Um, and uh, that, that's how it gained its acceptability in American culture, without showing too much sex. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Gracias. 
grandes avances que hayas hecho en la lectura de películas clásicas mexicanas, si lo podías compartir. Okay, can I can I comment on the uh, Mexican melodramas that I like? Yes. Okay. Uh, well, the, the, the Emilio Fernando ones um, with like Dolores del Rio, but my real favorite is Vitimas del Mercado, which has this wonderful musical element, and I think maybe you would say rhythm to it, uh, and and also Aventurera. Uh, so the two Nino Sevilla, which are, you know, over-the-top, excessive, musical, uh, and, 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 but, but there, there's a whole lot more. And uh, Buñuel's uh, Mexican period of melodrama, um, where I think he hated melodrama, but he, he used it uh, to the hilt. Uh, and so again, I want to I wanna see much more. There's a, there's a film that I especially want to see called, uh, oh, what is it, Odela de Oblivion, Oblivion. Um, it, everyone says it is the Mexican vertigo. Uh, Exactamente, un mejor definición uh, uh, es muy importante. Y no, no estoy toda uh, satisfecho de re, re, reposta de um, Zarazosa. Um, por para mí es el cuestión. La cuestión. La cuestión. Uh, I want to thank you. You've been a really wonderful uh, uh, respondent, uh, interventionist, and all of that. Thank you very much. Thank you.